Please take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 3. We'll be looking for the second time at Matthew 3. And we'll begin reading in verse number 13. And we'll read just a few verses this evening. Verses 13 through 17. Hear, O people of God, the word of the living God. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And there ended the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, once again we thank you that we are able to gather together on your day, the Lord's day, to come and worship you in singing and, and to pray and to hear the, the preaching of the word. And I pray, God, that you would prepare us for what we are going to see here and for the sermon that I am going to preach. Would you help me in the delivery of that message? That it would not just be words, but that your spirit would work in the hearts of your people, that they may be encouraged, and that Christ would be faithfully proclaimed. We pray that all that's done here would be done for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the first part of this third chapter, we're introduced to John the Baptist. Now we see people from all around Israel coming to be baptized by him. They're coming, confessing, and repenting of their sins. And he's baptizing them, and he's telling them, one is coming after him who is mightier than he. And this one who is coming is, is going to be the one who is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And now in verse 13, the one who was coming has finally arrived. It says, Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. So Jesus comes from Galilee to John the Baptist, and he seeks not to preach, at least not yet, but he seeks to be baptized by John. And this no doubt confuses John. John had been sent to prepare the way for the Lord. John had been preaching that someone was coming. Someone who is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And now that the Lord has come, we find him meekly coming to John and submitting to him in this act of baptism. And John even tries to prevent Jesus from being baptized, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and you're coming to me? And if this one is, is, is the one John was supposed to prepare the way for, surely he doesn't need a baptism. John was to prepare people to meet their Lord, right? That was his mission. And after all, baptism symbolizes God's cleansing. And if this man's the Lord, he is in no need of cleansing. But what does Jesus say? 
First of all, Jesus does not disagree with John and his statement. Jesus knows that he does not need a baptism, but Jesus insists that he is baptized anyway. Why? Well, our Lord gives us the answer, and the answer is right here in the text. We don't have to speculate on this. He says, permit it to be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus is not coming to John to be baptized because he's a sinner and needs cleansing. Jesus is coming to John to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Now, one of Christ's indictments against the Pharisees is that though they claim to be good Jews, they are the children, they are really the children of those who killed the prophets. We mentioned last time that many of the scribes and Pharisees, they were not listening to God's prophet, John, and they were not listening to him because they were refusing to be baptized by him. They were rejecting John and his message of repentance. Our Lord reveals this truth in his parable of the wicked husbandman, Matthew 21. Remember a certain householder plants a vineyard, leaves it in the hands of some husbandmen while he's out of the country, and the householder sends servants again and again, one by one, to receive the fruit of it, to, to receive the fruit of the vineyard. And what happens? The husbandman that he left to tend to the vineyard killed them all. And then the householder, as a last measure, sends his son, saying, Surely they will reverence my son. And they do to him the same thing that they had done to all of the others that he had sent. The Pharisees are the husbandmen in that parable, as well as all the unbelieving Jews who would not accept the Lord Jesus Christ. They give lip service to the prophets, but they were really the enemies of the prophets. They had not received the other true prophets of God, and they were not going to receive Jesus. But Jesus, because He's a good Jew, a perfect Jew was showing that he too was in agreement with the prophet. Though he was the one whom the prophet had been preaching about, he was also on a mission to live a perfect and obedient life to the will of the Father. If you remember, Jesus said, I have come not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And since God's will was that all true Israelites listen to and endorse the prophets, Christ comes and He submits to John in baptism. So what do we see going on? We see Jesus coming from Galilee to John. We see that Jesus is then baptized by John. And we gather from John's Gospel that it was at this point that Jesus was declared to be the Lamb of God. John says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. We see that after Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit comes down out of heaven like a dove upon Jesus, alighting a, a upon Him. And then we have, at the end, the Father speaking from heaven. And what does He say? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So what, what could we say to sum up in one sentence what is going on here? Well, the Trinity. The Trinity is what is going on here. The Trinity is working to save us. Each divine person of the Trinity is working in His own way and playing His own role to save us and redeem us. There are other places in Scripture where we can distinctly see the divine persons of the Trinity working together to accomplish something. We believe in one God. 
in three divine persons. And this triune God has one will, one purpose, one substance and essence. We see this in the creation account in Genesis. God, the Trinity, the triune God working together to accomplish something. We have in the beginning God. That's how the, that's how the, the Bible begins. In the beginning, God. And not many more verses after that, we have the Spirit of God moving about the face of the waters. And then we have the Father and the Son having a conversation with each other, saying, let us, let us make man in our image. And so God reveals His Trinitarian nature many times in Scripture. You know, we do not need a verse in the Scriptures that says, uh, you know, God is a Trinity... Because we see so many times the Trinity at work. Three divine persons, one God. And so the baptism of Jesus, as we see here, is just one of those times. That we see the Trinity working together to accomplish something. In this case, the Trinity is working together to accomplish salvation. Now, since we see the Trinity working here to accomplish God's plan of redemption. I, I want to look at the way in which the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all play a crucial and specific role in our salvation. And so the first person of the Trinity I would look, like to look at this evening is God the Father. Now, it's not to the end of this chapter 3 that we hear from the Father and the Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But the plan of redemption begins with the Father. In eternity past, the Father sets His love upon sinners, and He decides that though mankind will fall, He will not utterly forsake Him. We see here in our text how that God was most pleased with Christ. He was most pleased with Christ, and He set His divine love upon Christ. And as God was pleased with Christ and set His love upon Him, so God also, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is pleased to set His love upon sinners. The Father demonstrates this by sending Christ to live and die for sinners, Romans 5, 8. For, but, but God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But before all of this happens, in eternity past, God the Father decides that He will save sinners. Not for any foreseen goodness in them, but merely of His good pleasure, merely of His grace. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 9 that God has mercy on whom He will have mercy, and He will have compassion on whom He will have compassion. God the Father has chosen people out of fallen mankind whom He will save, and He will not leave in their sin and depravity. What's His reason? Well, we know that the Father sets His love upon sinners through Christ. But why? does He set His redemptive love upon particular sinners? Well, I like what is written in the 39 Articles. It says, Before the foundations of the world were laid, God has constantly decreed by His counsel secret to us to deliver from curse and damnation those who He has chosen in Christ out of mankind and to bring them by Christ to everlasting salvation as vessels made to honor. That's 39 articles. What does Westminster say? Something very similar. It says that God saves sinners whom He has chosen according to His eternal and immutable purpose and the secret counsel and good pleasure of His will. Now this, this election, this God choosing people before the foundation of the world is found in Ephesians chapter 1, just to name one place. God has chosen us, those of us who believe in Him, in Christ, 
before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, God has chosen those who He will extend His mercy to. And this reason is secret to us. Yes, we know that it is not because there's any goodness in us. You know, God did not see any goodness in us or faith and, and cho choose us for that reason. We know that. But we do not know why He chooses us particularly as objects of His mercy and grace. Paul tells us it was according to the good purpose of His will. But that's all we have. That's why both Westminster and the 39 Articles say that God chooses us for a reason that is secret to us. His secret counsel. So we have God the Father choosing to save some sinners out of the fallen lump of mankind through a Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. So in this we see that the Father plays the role of electing or choosing us to be the objects of His mercy and grace. We also see that He plays the role in planning uh, what was necessary to accomplish this. In this chapter, God the Father speaks from heaven. As Jesus is baptized, He speaks from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He puts His stamp of approval on what is going on. He affirms that this is His plan of redemption coming to fruition. And so, we've looked at the Father's role briefly in planning salvation. But, how is the Father going to carry out His plan to save those whom He has chosen to save. And this is where the work of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes in. We see in this chapter Jesus entering into public ministry through baptism. But long before this, even before the world was made, Jesus Christ played His role in carrying out God's plan to save sinners in His pre-incarnate state as the eternal Word. Now, because Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, He is co-eternal. He is co-equal with the Father. The Father cannot simply order the Son to become man and die for us, as if the Father outranks the Son, and the, son can tell the, or the Father can tell the Son what, what to do, and, and the Son merely obeys Him. Now, that would be the Arian view of the Trinity. Because we, we are orthodox, we understand that there must have been a covenant, an agreement made between the Father and the Son. An agreement made before the foundation of the world. That the Son was going to be the one who was going to make this plan happen. And so in this covenant, the Son decides that He is going to become man and do what was necessary to make God's plan possible. Now we know that Jesus submitted to the will of the Father during His incarnation. You know, Jesus, once again, He says, you know, I've come not to do mine own will, but the will of Him that sent me. I do always the, the things that please the Father. And so Christ in His incarnation, He is in submission to the Father. But we're speaking of a covenant made before the incarnation, before Christ uh, lays aside His glory and steps into humanity. And so Christ, out of love, volunteers to make God's plan of redemption possible. He volunteers to become man, to submit to the Father, and to die a sacrificial death for us. Christ volunteers for this. See, God wants, you know, He, he, he knows man's going to fall. He wants to extend His mercy towards sinners. But because of His holy character and justice, He cannot do so unless His Son lives and dies in their place. And this is what Jesus is doing here in this third chapter as it comes to a close. He's entering into public ministry. 
And he's starting it off by being baptized. Christ came from heaven to fulfill all righteousness. And being baptized by John is just a part of his fulfillment of that righteousness. Christ is living a perfect life in our place. He is being baptized not because he has sin and he needs cleansing, but because he's doing what God had commanded all Israelites to do in that day, which was to acknowledge John as a prophet and to go along with God's plan. Christ dies on the cross for us by making an atonement for our sins. He reconciles us to the Father. But, but He also lives a perfect life. A life of righteousness and goodness. A life of faith and obedience. So that He can then as a gift give that righteousness back to those who believe in Him. Christ dies for sinners so that they could obtain forgiveness. And Christ lives a perfect life of righteousness so that sinners can stand before God not in their own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ. And we see our Lord Jesus Christ in action here, being baptized, doing something, earning our righteousness, earning positive righteousness for us so that years later, when the Father would draw us to Himself to save us, Christ's righteousness could then be imputed to us to be our cloak on the day of judgment so that we would not be condemned in our sin but instead counted as righteousness, as counted as righteous. So, you know, with this imputation of the righteousness of Christ, which, which He's working here in this baptism to obtain for us, with this righteousness given to us, you know, we're not only forgiven, but we're righteous for the sake of Christ. If we were to plead to God for mercy for our sake, we have no guarantee that the Lord would hear us. We have no guarantee that the Lord would forgive us. But if we plead to God to have mercy on us for Christ's sake, He's able to hear us and forgive us because the sacrifice and the righteousness of His Son speaks infinitely more for us than our sin says against us. Through Christ Jesus, God secures the salvation of those who are the objects of His mercy and grace and His love. For it was in love that He predestined us and made us accepted into, into the Beloved. It was in love that He shared His Son with us to bring many sons to glory. And this is the confidence we have in Jesus Christ, that if we sin, we have this Advocate. We have Christ as our Advocate. He is, he is the propitiation for our sins. And if we repent, we can look to the cross and know that our sins have been taken care of there. No matter how grotesque the sin may be, no matter how many times we have fallen, if we turn from the sin, from that sin and keep purposing in our hearts to go and sin no more, we are assured that God, through the cross, forgives us and that Christ's righteousness covers us. If our righteousness before God was chipped away at every time we sinned, we'd end up losing it all. We would lose our righteousness. But since Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness, fulfill the law, really fulfill a whole life as the last Adam on behalf of us who believe in Him, we are now able to stand before God in His righteousness, all the while still struggling against our sins. Now, if we were, we were to stand before God in our own righteousness, a struggle with sin uh, would mean we were doomed. But with the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, we know that our struggles and strivings against sin and our desire to be rid of it means we're spiritually alive. 
and our sins are under the blood of Jesus. And for those of us who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone and are at war with sin, you know what that means? It means that we are undergoing sanctification. And those who are being sanctified, they have been justified. Not by what they have done, but justified by what Christ has done for them. This is the Son's role. He has done the work. He's lived the, the righteous life. He's died and risen again to make peace between us and God and to give us a right standing with Him. So the Father plans our salvation. The, the Son redeems us through His life, death, and His resurrection. And now we come to the role of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is the applicator. He is the one who comes and applies the work of Christ to our souls in time and experience. The Westminster Shorter Catechism answers the question, or it asks the question, how doth the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? And the answer is, the Spirit applieth to us the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us, and thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. So the way in which the Spirit works is demonstrated here in this baptism. We've, we've spoken about previously about how God sends His Spirit from above and how the, the waters of baptism picture this. It says in verse 16, When He had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to Him, and He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon Him. Matthew says the Spirit descends, it comes down upon Christ after He comes up from the water. We know that Christ sheds His blood for us on the cross. But how is His blood applied to us? And this is through the Holy Spirit. This is how the Holy Spirit works to apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ. God sends His Holy Spirit from heaven and quickens us to spiritual life, applying the atonement of Christ to our souls. Now Charles Wesley said it best in one of his famous hymns. I'll read for you a few lines. Then with my heart I first believed believes with faith divine, power with the Holy Ghost received to call the Savior mine. I felt the Lord's atoning blood close to my soul applied. Me, me He loved, the Son of God, for me, for me He died. Wesley says, I felt the Lord's atoning blood close to my soul applied. And this is through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, universalism not only teaches that God loves everyone unconditionally, but that Christ has died for everyone in such a way that everyone benefits from His death unto salvation. This is false. And we know this is false because it's only by the application of the Spirit that Christ's benefits are applied to sinners. It doesn't take a theological scholar to walk around in our community and come to the conclusion that very few have the Holy Spirit. We know this because if they had the Holy Spirit, they would be bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit in their life. So what does this mean? It means that since few have the Spirit, few have received Christ's benefits. We also have this, the way in which the Holy Spirit works, uh, demonstrated in the original Passover. The children of Israel were told to apply the blood uh, to the doorposts and the lintel of their houses. 
This would tell the angel of death to pass over their home and not to kill the firstborn son. Any home that had applied the blood escaped God's judgment. And those houses in Egypt that did not have the blood applied, they received God's wrath. They received a visitation from the angel of death and found their firstborn son dead. The blood they put on their doors was a type and shadow of the blood of Christ. And the person applying the blood to the door is a type and shadow of the Holy Spirit. Something must be done to take the benefits of Christ's life, death, and resurrection and personally apply those benefits to the individual sinner. This is accomplished by the application of of the Holy Spirit to us. As soon as the Spirit brings life to our souls in regeneration, the benefits of Christ are applied to us. The benefits of Christ, they're tied to the Holy Spirit. And they're tied to the Holy Spirit because God does not send His Holy Spirit into the heart of anyone who He has not chosen to have mercy on. And there's no one whom God chooses to have mercy on that Christ did not die for. The Holy Spirit is the last person of the Trinity in order to work in saving us. He completes the plan. He seals the deal. As the Scripture says, those of us who believe were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of redemption. We look at the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Christ was Trinitarian in nature. Romans 10.9 says that God raised Jesus from the dead. God the Father. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Well, then we have Christ telling His disciples that no man was able to take his life from him, but that he held the power to lay it down and he held the power to raise himself back up again. And we're told in other places in Scripture, particularly Romans 8, 11, that the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. It says, if the Spirit of Him who raised Christ Jesus dwell in you, So that's what it says in Romans 8.11. The, the, now, the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15.20 that the risen Christ is the first fruits of those who, we, who will be raised by the Lord at His coming. Christ is the first fruits. And he says to the Corinthians, For we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And so there, there's coming a day where our salvation is going to be completed at the resurrection. We look at the golden chain of redemption. Those whom He, he, he calls, He justifies, and those whom He justifies, He glorifies. Well, that glorification is that final stage which we experience at the resurrection where our bodies are raised, imperishable, incorruptible, immortal. And so the resurrection of God's people at the last day will be an act of the Trinity, just as Christ's resurrection was an act of the Trinity, because Christ is the firstfruits. So as He was raised, so shall we be raised. And we see God the Father raised Christ from the dead, the Son raised Himself from the dead, and the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead, we will also be raised by the, by the Trinity, by the triune God from the dead. Every aspect of our salvation is being worked out by God. Of course, yes, we are told to 
uh, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But it's God who is, at, who is at work in us, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Now the theme of the whole Bible can be summarized in three words. Creation, fall, and redemption. Now the fall was man's fault. But we see from the beginning of time, the Trinity, beginning with the work of creation, we see the Trinity active in that. And we see from the fall of Adam in Genesis 3 all the way to Revelation, the Trinity at work to save us, to save His people. The Father planning, the Son redeeming, and the Holy Spirit applying, or ap yeah, applying the works of Christ to His people. And so with that, we'll close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your plan of redemption. Somehow, us as believers found favor in Your sight unmerited favor. You set your love upon us. Not because we did anything good or not even because we, you foresaw that we had faith. But simply because it was your will. Simply because it was your good pleasure. It was a reason secret to us. And so for that, all we can do is stand in awe and be thankful that you chose to have mercy upon us. We are thankful that you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to carry out this plan, to redeem us, to live a perfect life for us so that we may have righteousness before you, to die for us so that we might be forgiven and to be raised from the dead that we might be raised at the last day. At the last day. And we thank you, O oh God, for the work of the Holy Spirit, applying all that Christ did for us, to us, making it all effectual. You, O oh God, you have worked in this way. You have revealed yourself as Trinity. And may we never forget to worship you in Trinity. We give you glory and honor for everything that you, are, you have accomplished, what you're working to accomplish now, and what you plan to accomplish in the future. And we thank you for including us in those plans. We ask that as we go forth this week, that we could have opportunities to be ambassadors for your kingdom, to tell people about the triune God who saves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our last hymn.